All right, so this is going to be a three-part series where I just talk about the gaming landscape and parts of it. There won't be super heavy editing or anything like that. I'll try to keep it to a standard so that if you do want to watch it, it's still comprehensive, but it'll mostly just be me rambling and talking about the gaming landscape. But this is probably something you should just chuck to the side and listen to. In this first part, I'll be talking about the AAA market and kind of what's going on over there. And then I'll switch to the indie market and I'll talk about the rise of indie games. Then in the second video, we'll go over things that are a bit more personal to me. So esports and how the competitive mindset kind of um, affects your relationship with video games. Uh, and then we'll go over certain genres that I think need revitalization or kind of restructuring. Um, and then certain genres that are struggling and maybe need some new blood. Then if I do do a third video, um, no promises that I can do it. But if I do, it'll be going over comments, it'll be going over friends opinions. And I'll just kind of talk about what I agree with what I disagree with. And um, yeah, I thought I'd do that just as a bit of fun. Anyway, let's get into it. If I could summarize my personal feelings towards the gaming industry right now, I'd say that my friendship has ended with AAA studios and my new best friends are indie studios. I remember a time when AAA studios were competing with each other and because of that, the games that we got were so much better and there was so much competition, it led to debates. But when was the last time you heard the Call of Duty vs Battlefield debate? I feel like those debates have kind of dropped off. I feel like nowadays AAA studios don't need to compete because they've either bought out all of their competition or are now more concerned with making money off their existing products. This mainly means microtransactions and free to play and games as a service models. Companies like Ubisoft and EA are well known for their predatory and aggressive microtransaction methods and their reputation has certainly dipped because of it. We see the games as a service model being used by multiple developers, promising that after you buy or download the game, more and more content will be released for it for years to come. This is a really good way to monetize and retain players, but of course it can be quite predatory too. And free to play games have never been more popular among players and studios. And for that company to make profit off of a free to play game, they need to monetize it. But does the increase in monetization strategies actually have an impact on the quality of games being released? Most of the time, there isn't a direct link between microtransactions and the quality of the game, unless the purchase somehow gives an unfair advantage over other players or somehow speeds up or trivializes the experience, they are mostly harmless. For example, Sony could put cosmetic bundles into God of War and while it would be controversial, the quality of the game wouldn't change. But that's also assuming that their intention was to make a quality finished title from the beginning. It's obvious that the impact monetization and microtransactions have occurs way before and during development. I'm no expert in this field and I could be totally wrong here, but it's obvious that certain games have gone downhill as soon as companies realized that they could make more money off yearly releases of an average quality than releasing one less often of better quality. I'm not saying that studios release games with the sole intention of filling it to the brim with microtransactions, but I am saying that the final product for some studios is definitely affected by the fact that they are trying to maximize profit. It sucks because my opinion is that it is totally possible to have a fantastic and well-made game that also has microtransactions, even if they are predatory. And if the game is great, surely people will stick around and purchase more microtransactions. But we rarely see this. Instead, we get games like Modern Warfare 2 that release with fully working in-game stores, but major missing pieces of content and a generally buggy experience. Sometimes you get a Cyberpunk 2077, which has turned it around massively since they launched, but the greed that was there on launch bit them in the ass. Whether it was the greed of the publisher or the developers is irrelevant. It was financial greed that gave us an unfinished product. It's hard to talk about the downfall of AAA Studios without talking at length about how it's been optimized for maximum profit. But there are other aspects of game development affected by this too. Innovation is one of them. Innovation is something that I rarely see in AAA games nowadays. I don't want to keep beating the dead Ubisoft horse, but come on now, the joke has been made a thousand times already. But it's not even a joke. They genuinely do do the same shit over and over. I thought Far Cry 6 was all right, but it still stunk of Ubisoft copy and paste filler content. And the fall from grace Assassin's Creed has seen is unreal. But it's not just Ubisoft. Open world formulas have remained the same for years and popular shooter titles follow trends that have been proven to work, but get stale quick. One of the things that makes me personally sad is how in multiple games today, the attention to detail in interactions with the game world have been mostly ignored. 
The best way I can explain this is to take a look back at Far Cry 2. That game wasn't the greatest, but the attention to detail in environmental interaction made the experience that much better. It sounds weird, but I loved how you could cut leaves off at pretty much the exact point of contact and how the fire spread around the trees too. Probicat's video on GTA 4 versus GTA 5 is exactly what I'm talking about. GTA 4 felt so much more realistic when it came to environmental interactions and GTA 5 seemed to leave a lot of them out. This disappoints me because one of the largest aspects of fun in video games is being able to answer the question, what happens if I do this? What happens if I throw this grenade here or shoot this person in the leg or this or that? It just sucks to see studios with the capabilities to make interactions like this work, not bother to include them. And I understand why, it just makes me a little sad. But not all AAA studios have fallen victim to mediocrity. Sony and their respective studios and developers have been making games that get better and better each time, and we need to give credit where credit is due. Breath of the Wild was a refreshing take on open world formulas, Obsidian's Grounded was awesome, Rockstar continues to be solid, and From Software seems to have found their perfect style. But games are getting harder and harder to make with longer and longer development cycles, so good games seem to come out less often than the golden days. Just look at what was released in 2012. Borderlands 2, Far Cry 3, Dishonored, Assassin's Creed 3, Max Payne 3, Spec Ops The Line, The Walking Dead, Journey, Mass Effect 3, Black Ops 2, Guild Wars 2. You scroll down, you start to see Darksiders 2, Sleeping Dogs, Resident Evil 6, Diablo 3. There are so many games here that I haven't played or that uh, wouldn't usually play, but that are in genres that I know other people love. Faster Than Light was released in 2012. Now let's have a look at games that were released in 2013. Bioshock Infinite, GTA 5, The Last of Us, Tomb Raider, Stanley Parable, Metro Last Light, Saints Row 4. Payday 2 was released in 2013. Crisis 3, 2013. We'll ignore Call of Duty Ghosts. Blood Dragon for Far Cry 3, Dead Space 3, Pikmin 3, Dead Rising 3, Battlefield 4, Batman Arkham Origins, Warframe. And without a doubt, there are so many more games that have been released in this kind of era of gaming that absolutely changed the, the landscape. Crazy shit, right? And of course, incredible games are still being released today, but because some of them are quite similar to previous games or have concepts that have been done before, the amount of games to be truly excited for seems to be wavering. But it's not all doom and gloom. I believe 2023 is going to be a stellar year for video games. And personally, I cannot fucking wait to get into it. Not only for AAA games, but for indie games too. Hogwarts Legacy, Atomic Heart, Dead Island 2, Payday 3, For the King 2, Hades 2, Redfall, Starfield, Silksong, Party Animals, Sons of the Forest, and so, so, so many more. Gaming has changed drastically over the years, and I believe a big part of that is how companies' view on games has changed. They used to need to innovate and include multiple pieces of enticing content to draw players in. Now players' nostalgia and wallets are continuously exploited. Anyway, those were my thoughts on AAA games. Let's move on to a more positive area. Indie games innovate often. You had your roguelikes back in the day, like Faster Than Light, Binding of Isaac, Risk of Rain, Rogue Legacy, and look at them now. They've had major innovations to their core gameplay loop and have inspired countless other games. Even a game like Limbo has inspired countless narrative-driven indie games. Deck builders have built off Slay the Spire's legacy, and without a doubt, Hades will have inspired many, many, many games for years to come. The rise of indies is no accident. I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but where do you think people would tend to look once their favorite big studio started to let them down? The rise of indie studios has happened because it is a much cheaper, much more reliable source of video games. Yes, the art style might not be for everyone, and even the genres that are popular among indie titles don't appeal to everyone, so how have they risen up so far? I think the combination of a much more refined and focused gameplay loop and a cheap price of entry in comparison to the bigger games makes for a much more fulfilling experience. Hades is one of the most complete quality games released in the last few years, and it's a fraction of the price of a AAA title. The value for your money you get with indie games is fucking ridiculous. I paid $35 for Hades and put 114 hours into it. I got Gunfire Reborn in early access for like 20 bucks, 164 hours. Same with Rogue Legacy 2, 67 hours. And Vampire Survivors is $7.50. Like, huh? Are you kidding me? This value for money is unbeatable. Games I have hundreds of hours in cost the same amount of money as some bullshit DLC pushed by other companies. I mentioned a refined gameplay loop. I've talked about this before, but I think this is a big reason why indie games are so good. They keep your attention because the gameplay is often so much tighter and more focused. These games don't need to fuck around with big spectacles, huge stories, massive open worlds, or lifelike graphics. They just need to make sure that the gameplay is fun. And that freedom to focus on that one important thing is crucial. 
Risk of Rain 2 doesn't need to focus on anything superficial. Just make sure the core gameplay loop is fun and I will put 186 hours into it, don't worry. I also think that a big reason indie developers consistently put out great games is due to their work culture. Compare a cozy small team of developers working on one game to the massive scale operations that the larger companies run. It's not an accident that the gameplay is more focused when ideas and processes are only shared between so many people. I can imagine it's easy for inspiration to get lost in a big office environment, and I'm sure a lot of huge development studios don't feel like a tight-knit team or a family. Whereas indie devs work so closely with one another so that the vision of the final product isn't lost and the workplace culture feels a lot more manageable. Not every big studio is a dystopian hellhole though. We recently saw a video where CD Projekt Red was explaining their process for improving their workplace culture and providing real incentives for employees, which I think is great. But indie studios wear their heart on their sleeve and kind of live or die by the quality of their games. And while they feel more trustworthy and familiar, they do make a lot of money still and the IPs they create can be extremely valuable. I want to turn your attention to something that happened recently, which was Gearbox Software buying the Risk of Rain IP from Hopu Games. Gearbox had been publishing Risk of Rain for a while, but recently bought the IP, which means Gearbox now owns Risk of Rain 2 and the development of future Risk of Rain titles. Gearbox already publishes existing indie titles like Have a Nice Death, Tribes of Midgard, etc., but it could become a much more popular trend to buy out the IPs for these games, to take the development to other places, or to make sequels to profit off the existing fan bases. So indie studios and their IPs can hold a lot of power, but I think indie games struggle too. I've played a lot of different indie games that compete in the same genre, and it's very easy for them to fall short of their competitors. Dead Cells and Rogue Legacy 2 both top the 2D style for me, so games like Neon Abyss and Have a Nice Death just kind of indirectly fall short, even though they are all unique in their own way. As I'm playing through deck builders, it's very clear to me that Slay the Spire shits on all the other competition. It's a cutthroat industry, and I think it's that way because it's much harder to start a relationship with consumers in comparison to larger companies. So once you've got your fan base, you better not let go. Larger companies play with their fan bases like they're a joke, but that's because they know they can afford to. Indie studios only get so many chances, and it's harder to get those chances without large marketing budgets or the help of a publisher. It's neither here nor there, I just thought it would be something interesting to mention. But for now, indie games are incredibly strong, and my biggest praise towards indie games is again, for how a fraction of the price of a AAA game, I can get over 100 hours of playtime consistently. It's mind-blowing, and I don't think the indie market is going to slow down anytime soon.